Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and a big thank you to Lars for uh, organizing this on, on short notice as well. We're going to cover very quickly uh, what is peace innovation. We're going to talk a little bit about two different theories of defense, a traditional theory of defense and a new emerging theory of defense and the technology that makes that possible. We'll talk a little bit then about uh, a little overview of what peace technology is. And, uh, and then we'll give some examples from the wild. That will be the first part of the talk. So we'll cover this in the first half, and then in the second half, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about exactly why I'm here, why we're so interested in partnering with you, and uh, what a Peace Innovation Lab here in Sunsfall could look like, and how that would work, and why we think that would benefit you, and, and I'll, I'll be very transparent about why it would benefit us also. So that's, that's the, the quick agenda. And uh, I'll try not to get sidetracked, and I'll try not to um, go on too many tangents. Rain me in if I do, please. This is the academic version of what we do. I apologize for the, the wordiness, but um, the, the words you should pay attention to are the ones in bold. Quantitative, predictive, computational, and then fundamentally profitable. Um, although generative is also important. The, um, the challenge I always have in presenting our work is that people are not used to hearing the words peace and technology and business in the same sentence, but that's actually what we're going to be talking about today. This is the much simpler definition. We're creating augmenting technology, and it is augmenting people's ability to be good to each other. Does anybody see a problem with that definition? Probably can't put the same technology used to be bad to each other. It can, although we have a nice benefit in this case. Uh, it's a little bit harder to use it to be bad to each other, and the returns are a lot less. Because when you use it to be bad to other people, it fundamentally breaks networks, and so it breaks value creation processes. However, does anybody wonder who gets to decide what that is? Please keep wondering that. We put that in there on purpose so that people flinch. Because um, this technology, this set of technologies is at a point similar to where aviation was in 1910. If you remember, if you go back a little bit before the turn of the last century, the late 1800s, all sorts of people were beginning to believe that it was actually possible to combine technologies in new ways so that finally we could become a species that could fly. And uh, in 1903, we succeeded in doing that, and within seven years we became, because of a convergence of new technologies, we became a species that was flying farther, faster, higher, carrying more weight than any other species had ever done before. And in 1914 we promptly used that technology to inflict a lot of harm on ourselves. Um, we are at a similar point with these kinds of technologies, and that goes to your point about, yes, they can be dangerous. So the technology itself then, what is that augmenting technology? I think I pretty much just said that, didn't I? We look at peace in terms of episodes of engagement between individual people. Um, actually, one step lower than that as well. So, so normally we're measuring it in terms of a dyad, person A, person B. But you should think of it as entity A and entity B, and I'll draw a little diagram for you later. Um, we can actually use the same kind of technology now to mediate the quality of engagement between individual parts of yourself as well. So when you were talking about things that help individuals be more at peace with themselves, there is, for example, the, the part of me that would really like to have an energy drink right now, and there's the part of me that would really like to be healthy, and these two parts of me might be in conflict, and there are technologies now that can help me pay more attention to what I consume and consume things more healthily and uh, make it easier for me to do the healthy thing, like eat a salad and drink some water, and make it harder for me to uh, do the unhealthy thing, like reach for a monster beverage, which I'm, for anybody who's worked with me, you know that I'm notoriously addicted to monster drinks. <laughs> Confessions right up front. Um, so we can do it right down at that individual level. We can do it right up at the large scale level as well. I'll talk a little bit more about the large scale level later. But why are we the Peace Innovation Lab rather than just the Peace Lab? Because we think there's a fundamental uh, connection between innovation and peace. Essentially, innovation um, 
enables us to create new value that didn't exist before, and in the process, create new value that is mutually beneficial when innovation is done right, which increases our ability to collaborate together across difference boundaries. And you should see that difference boundaries are fundamental to innovation. There's a mountain of research out there now that shows that if you have uh, people on an innovation team who are very similar to each other, the quality of their innovation will generally be mediocre. But if you have people on an innovation team who are very different from each other, the more different they can be as long as they can still bridge those differences with communication, generally the higher quality of innovation they will turn out. So more peace enables more of that communication, which enables more difference boundaries, more diverse people to work together on teams, which increases the quality of innovation, and so it goes. So um, here's what we're facing. The next 30 years, all the predictions are saying that people are not going to experience human violence nearly as much because the army of some other country is invading their country. They're going to experience it because, and this is David Kilcullen's work, but it, it's indicative of uh, general consensus in, in uh, the, the world of defense at the moment, that um, most human violence in the next three or four decades is going to be in densely populated urban coast, coastal and highly networked environments. And it's going to be at the hands of non-state actors. This will be militias, rebels, gangs, um, sometimes the police, and uh, I leave it to you to decide um, to what degree you think the police are a gang or not in, in the case of Ferguson. Uh, a question. The word of peace, <coughs> Is it the big word of peace, or is it uh, to feel peaceful uh, as a translation? Is it, I mean, the big peace, peace, war and peace, peace and war, or is it peacefulness, in, in individual feeling, or is it just as a translation? We, so we think that um, the kind of peacefulness you feel comes as a result of the, what you're calling the big peace, which is peace between people. The key difference now is that what we've been calling the big peace we used to measure it in terms of the relationship between countries, um, and now we can measure it in a much more nuanced and detailed and precise way. We also, when we measured the relationship between countries, we would do things, for example, we would count the number of dead bodies, and we would say, well, there's less dead bodies today, so there must be more peace. So we were measuring negative peace and inferring positive peace from that. We're now in a situation, thanks to your industry, where we can measure positive engagement as it happens in real time, passively, ubiquitously in the environment. And so now we can talk about peace much more in terms of a peaceful interaction between you and I and the peaceful feeling that we both go away feeling afterwards because we had a great peaceful interaction together. Then we can look at the nation state stuff still, but now the nation state is the aggregate of these kinds of interactions. Does it make sense? Yes. Thank you, it's a good question. So, um, Again, thanks to your industry, for the first time in history, we're measuring and recording these individual episodes. And the devices that make this possible are becoming uh, more uh, distributed in our environment every day. And since we can measure specifically social behavior, which is, is engagement behavior between humans, um, we can begin to actually design technology that increases and augments our ability to be social, or, or actually we can do this for any behavior we want, in fact. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Everything we do in our lab is built on two things. It's, one is called persuasive technology. This is a field you should read about if you ha haven't already. Uh, developed by B.J. Fogg at Stanford and discovered by um, Byron Reeves and Cliff Nass in the early 90s. They discovered the basis for that. Uh, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about that. But these are, these are technologies that do change human behaviors. And then the way we design those technologies in our lab is using a process called behavior design. And hopefully that creeps you out just as much as the, the word about good and who gets to decide what good is. And so I'll be happy to answer questions about that as well. Please. We have a, a pre-study going on about what we call uh, innovative leadership, and uh, it's a lot of um, you know, curious question there. Uh, we've noticed that in, uh, in, 
in most organizations today, uh, control and, uh, and monitoring apparatus has grown to be a, a very big part of the, the ordinary day for the working people. This creates a lot of tension between people and also, uh, well, if you look upon it on a regional and local uh, part, uh, less collaboration. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that, that uh, has been, become very uh, obvious, but, but it's, not, uh, it's not being monitored in that way. It's, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the rate of, uh, uh, if you look upon um, the people who call in sick, um, uh, is increasing, and there are other factors also about the uh, level of uh, people having stress uh, in work-related uh, uh, situations. Um, it, it all comes down to, to that um, uh, the, the current organization models that we're using and the organization uh, types uh, are not uh, creating a peaceful environment. So, right. so I, I, I would just curious here if, if you're if you're starting to look at these behavior models or are you uh, monitoring uh, differences between uh, very uh, very strict uh, I mean by governmental organizations who, who have authority they, they are very uh, rigorous control compared yeah. to perhaps an, a very innovative entrepreneurial organization and, and how friction is created there yeah do, do you have the, there's to? there's friction in both contexts but uh, there's a different kind of friction in in the bureaucratic context certainly um, we're, we've done a little bit of work in that space. We pay a lot of attention to the work that other people are doing in that space. Um, um, I, I think one of, one of my heroes and our colleagues um, at Stanford, Paolo Parigi, uh, is doing some collaboration with um, one of his former students who's now at uh, Facebook data science team, uh, looking at similar kinds of things uh, and about trust issues that come as a result of um, actually as a result of increasing mechanisms of trust uh, and how the, the effect that has on social bonds and so on. Um, another uh, rock star in the field, I would like to say he's at Stanford, but he's at MIT, is um, Sandy Pentland. He's one of my heroes. Um, if, if you have not read his work on honest signals and uh, the research that he's done in organizations, it's absolutely fabulous, brilliant research. And he's very much looking at those kinds of things in, in terms of how organizational structures uh, affect the engagement of individuals within the organization. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's our research question. It's a little bit different than what people expect. Usually when we come to a city, people think we're looking for the biggest problem and we're going to go right to work on the biggest problem. Usually the biggest problem in any community is because there's low trust, low engagement, um, low skills to deal with it and also low resources. So we in fact start at the other end because we've also discovered when you sit people down and say what's the biggest problem in your community, they, their brain immediately goes into fight or flight mode because they start thinking about this intractable difficult thing that they've been working on for decades and still haven't been able to fix. If by contrast we say, what's the greatest thing about your city? What do you love most about living here? What are you most proud of? People start getting into a creative mode. They start uh, uh, accessing happy memories and so on that help them uh, positively engage with an opportunity instead. And so we start out trying to identify what works best in a community and looking this very specifically in our methodology at how we can improve that by even a few percent. And then we work our way down that stack. And the result is when we finally get to the problems, you know, uh, after six months or so, then we begin to say, okay, what's the smallest problem in the community? Let's start with that one. By that point, we have a lot of rapport. We have a lot of trust. We have a lot of people skilled in our process. And by the way, when you take the thing that's working really, really well in almost any city in the world and improve it by a few percent, that's probably a few million kroner of value to work with. And you can start building a, a resource chest as you go so that when you get down to this level, you've got trust, you've got engagement, and you have resources to begin to work with it. So we're really focused on this, um, the good side of peace, I should say. And uh, how many of you are familiar with Johan Galtum? Famous uh, peace researcher from just across the way, that other country next door. Um, Oslo. Um, he's uh, 
the first one that made this important distinction between negative peace and positive peace. Are any of you familiar with that? Okay, let me touch on that for just a moment. Negative peace is how do you get people to be less bad to each other. So negative peace is what we care about whenever violence breaks out, whenever there's a, an, an actual, uh, well, especially when there's a um, physical or structural conflict of some kind. Um, but as a species, we are so cooperative that we actually think of positive peace as the baseline, as the norm. And, and positive peace is instead what most of us are much more concerned about on a daily basis, which is much more about this. How can we help people be good to each other? And how can we improve how good people are to each other? So one is about um, asset preservation. You, you, could see, um, you could see negative peace as, in many cases, it's, it's a fight over you know, who, who gets to have the beer, for example. And a lot of beer gets spilt while people are fighting and nobody's happy with the result and nobody feels like they got a fair share at the end. Positive peace is about new value creation, by contrast. Because you're looking at, OK, here's somebody I've never met before. What could we do for each other that would be mutually beneficial that hasn't been done yet? And, and so we start trying to fill in the gaps in the network. That creates new value in the process. Let me touch on theories of defense here, because um, there's no way to avoid the, the militarized aspects of this. There is a traditional theory of defense here, which is basically, that guy is a bad guy. And this is how we have been thinking about defense for most of history. And so it's focused on the identity of the person. And we're proposing that with these kinds of technologies, there's beginning to be an alternative, which is now that we can just measure people's behavior in very uh, precise detail in real time as it happens, um, we can start saying, eh, I don't know if the guy's a bad guy or not, but he's doing behavior that is destructive to us or unwanted by us. And that allows us to go in a different direction because when you work with the traditional theory of defense and you're saying he's a bad guy, you automatically come to these conclusions about what you need to do about him. These conclusions are all painful for him um, and unwanted by him. And then when you design technology that augments your ability to do these things, you end up with technologies that are like that. Technologies that have a pointy end to them, that are unpleasant to be on the receiving end of. Those technologies, by the way, cost you a lot of money to develop. And when you do develop them, you never want him to get hold of them because he'll point them back at you. Implicitly here, we're looking at the idea that somehow that guy has to be removed from the situation. So that's, that's actor theory. By contrast, we have a behavior theory where you have a different hypothesis at the beginning. You say he's doing behavior we don't like. So what can we do about that? We need to change his behavior. What do we need his behavior to be? We need it to be positive. We need it to be value creating. We need it to be mutually beneficial. Volkswagen's onto a good thing here, by the way, with their fun theory. Um, it's much better if it can be fun as well. And, and all of you that are interested in gamification in the room have some understanding that this can be tremendously powerful. Um, if you then start with this hypothesis and build technologies to improve that person's ability to behave in these ways, you get these kind of technologies. And they're very different. They're also very similar. There's still a defense system. But it's a defense system that defends everybody against violence instead of group A against group B or person A against person B. But it's also fundamentally, it's, it's still a weapon. It still has a direction. Now it's a weapon against a problem instead of against a person. But the other fun thing is, it's fun to be on the receiving end of this weapon now. It's not pointy-ended anymore, and it's not painful. And so in this case, you can take these technologies, you can give them to your worst enemy, you can say, please point them at me, and pull the trigger a lot, because it makes me a better person every time you do it. Um, so that's an interesting part of the difference here. Um, a quick comparison between a traditional actor-based uh, piece of defense technology and um, a positive payload system. We call these positive payload systems, by the way. Um, the, uh, this is a project we had the privilege of incubating. Uh, Ronnie Edry and his wife, Michal, did the Israel Loves Iran campaign on Facebook. Have any of you seen that? 
There's a beautiful TED talk about it if you care to spend 15 minutes. Um, by contrast, a traditional assault rifle, what you want to see is that both technologies have these seven components. The key thing to notice here is that the most expensive part of this system is the soldier you have to train to carry the gun around. It's also the most expensive part to maintain and uh, also the most complicated part of the system to control. The most expensive part of the hardware system is uh, weapons research and development. If you've built an assault rifle and you need to come up with the next generation of assault rifle and you need to get it manufactured in mass, anybody want to guess roughly how long that takes? It's seven years to a decade to do that cycle of, of innovation, of, of improving the old style stuff. These modules in a positive payload system Almost all of these modules are primarily software. And so we have to fly through this today because we don't have much time. But the key takeaway here is, guess what the, the optimization cycle is over here by comparison? We can run 500 different versions of something in parallel at the same time. We run automated A-B split testing. And we can have uh, an evolutionary algorithm with some machine learning running behind that. And these things can get really smart really quick as a result. Um, there's a lot of juicy stuff to go into here. I would really like to in, dig into it more, but I'm trying to keep an eye on the time, and I'm thinking we don't really have enough time. So hopefully this just piques your curiosity, and we can talk about it in more depth another time. If you take those seven modules, um, they function together in what's called a fire control loop. Um, and if you are building large-scale weapons for the Navy, for example, um, you think in terms of fire control loops. But what you have is different modules of software, in our case. Uh, one that is um, tracking what's going on in the environment. That module is talking to what's uh, something that is doing uh, threat awareness, basically. It's looking for opportunity or, or uh, conflict. Then you need a targeting module. You need a deployment system of some kind. The payload in our case is almost always um, some kind of, either some kind of human action at the end, we, we get a human actor to do something nice to somebody else, or we automate a process that delivers a nice result of some kind, a reward of some kind to somebody. And then of course you have to be able to measure, did you hit your target or not, do you need to fire again? Um, if that's all working, then you look for ways to optimize it. If it's not working, you look for ways to make it work. What's interesting, and, and the reason that the modular design of this is so important is each of these modules can have an open API between them, and we can build a whole library of modules in each case, and then we can do automatic uh, recombinance testing to see which modules work best in which context. Do you get a little bit of an idea of why that's so powerful? That gives, um, that gives us a lot of horsepower because that library of solutions can be continually drawn on as we need it. I think this is probably about the time for me to start sketching things on the board. Um, I'm going to, yeah. So one of the things we're famous for in the Valley is trying to make things as simple as possible. Uh, and if you can't draw it on the back of a napkin and somebody can't go home and draw it for their kids on the back of a napkin and say, this is what we worked on today, then it probably isn't simple enough yet in our theory. So um, I want to talk to you very quickly about um, episodes of human engagement. Historically, every time two people interacted, let's call this person A and person B, um, typically there was one of our four traditional convening technologies here. There was fire, or food, or beverage, usually alcoholic, or, or shelter. Um, and for most of our history as a species, we have been, the reason we have been interacting, the reason we developed these big frontal lobes and became a social species is because as a species, we have no fangs, we have no claws, we have no shells or thick fur. We depended on each other and being able to act in groups in order to get access to these things in order to survive. Whenever you have two people like this interacting with each other, you start noticing group differences. And
And if you take any, uh, any, any group of people or, or uh, even any uh, pair of people and you stress them enough from the outside, conflict will eventually break out. And when it does, uh, it will typically be along what sociologists call one of the, the big eight conflict boundaries. And these are um, gender, so this person is male, this person is female, uh, these are age, old, young, um, rich, poor, socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity A or ethnicity B, language A, language B. If they talk long enough, they begin to see um, liberal or conservative, basically, uh, and, and I mean that in a worldview sense, not a, I mean, we're talking about politics, but in a very general sense, um, uh, Jonathan Haidt has done work showing that uh, neurologically, people divide into these two basic groups where you want to keep things as they are or you're very open to change, basically, and that, that's what I mean by liberal conservative. Most of our political affiliations flow from uh, those basic differences in the brain. Uh, if they talk a little longer, they start to see religious differences, and uh, then also the survival of our species apparently depends on our ability to notice um, other people's sexual orientation. Those are what sociologists call the big eight. They are probably changing as we go in into the, the future. Um, but right now, uh, of course, we pay attention to a whole lot of other group identities as well. We pay attention to who's smart and uh, what people's skills are and so on. But this gives you a rough schematic, basically. And if there's a conflict that's going to happen, it's typically going to happen across one of these difference boundaries. So that's cool. That's what our species has been doing for at least 200,000 years. Um, the key thing is you weren't around. And so there are no sensors in this picture. And so all we have is anecdote and no data. And this is where the world started changing It's been changing for a while, but the big changes really came together in the last decade. We really noticed it in 2007. First of all, you started having cheap, ubiquitous sensors everywhere. And you combine that with, package it together with cheap communication technology, digital communication technology that's really good and begins to work in a network everywhere. And you package that together with widely distributed, cheap computation. And it's that triad, it's, it's that package together that revolutionizes everything. Because suddenly you start getting a world that instead of this, now looks like this. You still have person A. Now he has a device in his hand. That device connects him to a cloud, a whole cloud, that is growing larger every day of mediating technologies. And these technologies are augmenting our ability to interact to the way we have always interacted. And by augmenting, I mean they are making it faster or cheaper or easier or able to do it farther or able to do it more precisely, and there, there are a few other, few other adjectives in there as well. But, but if you design a new technology, and it isn't doing one of, one of these things, people probably won't adopt it, people probably won't use it. And so every time somebody builds a new web app, a new payment system, a new mobile app, they're adding another layer to this stack, and the stack includes all of traditional social media, but it includes a lot more than that as well. It includes things like payment systems. It includes things like um, um, old school stuff like email and SMS messaging as well as, and just voice phone calls as well. Um, so we keep adding layers and layers to this stack of technology every day. That in turn is now connecting him to person B. Person B now, might be wearing a device on their wrist if they bought one of the new Apple watches or, or a, a device on their waistband or some sort of wearable around their arm or some sort of uh, the new Ralph Lauren shirt that has all these sensors that is detecting your health in real time and so on. 
All of these things are possible, and more every day. And here's the key thing. This is why the world changed. Now, every time one of these episodes of mediated engagement happens, we get data that we never, ever had before that tells us about the quality of that episode of engagement between person A and person B. And we get that rich, precise, real-time data that we've never, ever had before. That data, pardon me for going off the edge here, but that data lets us model the relationship between person A and person B. Or, and this goes back to the feeling of internal peace that we talked about as well, it also lets us model the relationship between you know, the part of me that wants to eat another donut and the part of me that wants to be healthy. We can monitor those internal things as well. And there's your connection between the outside big piece and the inside uh, internal piece as well. When we model that relationship, that in turn allows us to simulate the relationship. I am tired enough that I'm having trouble spelling. Um, this will be good live entertainment for the, <laughs> for the video. Simulating the relationship means we can, we can run hundreds of different simulations in parallel to get some insights into which possible directing directions could be most valuable to push this relationship. That, in turn, allows us to design interventions. So we can sit down and say, we have person A and person B, or group A and group B, or entity A and entity B. How can we measurably improve the quality and quantity of engagement between them? We can test all sorts of different technologies to do that. We can test them very quickly because the interventions we design, we deploy, they are mediating technologies. We deploy them right back into this stack. And what I want you to realize here is we can typically run this loop and see if we're moving the needle or not in an hour or two, sometimes half an hour. So the optimization cycle here is incredibly fast compared to the old school technologies. So I'm not going to make any claims right now about the kind of things that we're developing being more powerful than an assault rifle. But I'm going to say, give it just a couple years, because assault rifles are not getting smarter. And the soldiers who carry them are getting incrementally, marginally smarter, whereas this stuff is getting logarithmically smarter. That's a key difference. Um, there's more to this, by the way. What we now see is these group differences that we were noticing right away, that our frontal lobes are uh, optimized and evolved to notice right away, turns out that we're actually really bad at that as a species. We're better than other species, more or less, but we're still really bad at it. Turns out that we all have thousands of group identities. And we wear those hats at different times every day. So how many of you travel a lot? How often was your passport checked this year? Yeah. So how many of us, since we were children, have been thinking that the political identity that mattered most, the political group affiliation that, we, that was most important to us, was our nationality? When in fact, the political identity that matters most to you, the geopolitical identity that matters most, is what city you live in or work in. That gets checked multiple times a day. What neighborhood in that city you live or work in, that's another group identity. That gets checked multiple times a day. What block in that neighborhood, what building in that block, what office or apartment in that building, those are all group identities. Well, yes. Which people you interact with, how many kids you have, what age your kids are, whether your 10-year-old daughter likes ballet or pink unicorns, all of these things are group identities. And there are companies that are spending billions of dollars every year to make sure they have you categorized in the right group. They're interested in, do you belong to the group of people who wear this kind of watch or that kind of watch? Drive this kind of car or that kind of car? And they're really interested to know, when are you going to change from driving the 2004 model of the car to driving the new 2015 model? For business intelligence, some of the things that we've been talking about, that's incredibly valuable data. And there are companies spending a lot of money to figure that stuff out. So I'm. I'm not trying to say, by the way, that this is a good thing. I'm just saying, suddenly these technologies are here, so it's now up to us to try and do as much good as we can with these technologies, because there's no putting them back in the box. 
we can use those many, many different group identities in interesting ways as part of the intervention design so that when, for example, we have a politician saying the only identity that matters is are you Russian or Ukrainian and you have another politician on the other side of the border saying no, the only identity that matters is are you Ukrainian or Russian we can sit down and make visible to people on both sides of the border how many things in fact they have in common. They went to school at the same place, they study the same kind of discipline, they have kids the same age, they drive the same kind of car, they both play soccer on the weekends. We can begin to make all of those things visible in a way that counteracts the political rhetoric a little bit. So that's, that's one example of a kind of intervention strategy that we can begin to do. Thank you for putting up with my messy artwork. This really is typically drawn on the back of a napkin. So now we can take those episodes of engagement that we're measuring and getting data on over here and we can begin to plot them. And this is actually a whole slide deck in itself, but I've just condensed it all into one slide for you here. Um, typically, we would be able to see if that quality of engagement between person A and person B or group A and group B was getting worse. And if we plotted those episodes over time, T1, T2, T3, T4, sorry, this is quality of engagement here and this is quantity of engagement here we would begin to see that, okay, this relationship is getting worse, and we'd be able to abstract a trend line and say, yeah, it's going downhill. And there's strange good news here. This is what's called a tightly constrained possibility space, or design space. What that means is, there's a floor to this ocean. You can only go so far in terms of negative engagement with somebody else or two groups between each other before one or both entities destroys themselves. And so you should imagine a little thermonuclear cloud here because that's the end of engagement. What we have traditionally meant by peace is that sometime before we hit that point, we should intervene on this trend line and drive things back in this direction. It's very important stuff. When you have a violent crisis, it's the kind of things that our friends at the Crisis Management Institute in Helsinki do very well, for example. It's typically the domain of policy and diplomacy or else philanthropy and charity. And I'm just going to remind you what I said about people fighting over the beer before. That's what's going on down here. Not a lot of new value getting created, a lot of old value getting destroyed. But this raises the question, by this old definition, peace is people ignoring each other. And in the kind of cities that we're looking at in the future, and in the kind of population increases that we're seeing in those cities, in the next four decades, depending on whose numbers you look at, people are saying between two and three billion people moving into cities. And another two or three billion people being born in those cities because their parents already moved into those cities. In those kind of environments, people ignoring each other is not a realistic opportunity, a realistic uh, possibility. It's not an option. So then if you start asking that other question, our research question, which is rather than how can we get people to be less bad to each other, how do we get people to be good to each other? How good can we be to each other? How can we design technology that makes it easier, cheaper, faster, etc., for people to be good to each other? Here's the advantage where there's a slight tilt in these technologies towards the good rather than the bad. We come from a species where 98 point something percent of us are pro-social. If you give us the choice and make it easy, we actually want to be nice to other people. We enjoy being nice to each other. There are about 2%, a little less than 2% sociopaths out there. Um, the reason we know that is because the army in their, in their um, entrance exams and, and boot camp process and everything, they're very, very focused on identifying who those sociopaths are because those are the kind of guys who will typically shoot their own officer in the back of the head when they get upset. And so they take those guys out and give them to the CIA, I think, to make assassins, I don't know, anyways. Um, th um, they actually do filter them out, and so they've been studying for, it's one of the biggest longitudinal samples out there of um, what percentage of, this, of society uh, really is uh, sociopathic. But for the other 98% of us, if you give us the ability to be nice to people, Many of us will go do that just for the fun of it. Just because it's enjoyable. So what you should imagine over here is a layer of augmenting technologies. The traditional defense technologies are augmenting our ability to do harm to each other. 
these kind of new defense technologies are augmenting our ability to be good to each other. And you start noticing when you look at the quality of engagement between person A and person B with mediating technologies, you start noticing that there are some, some layers to this. You have to be able to, first of all, make person A aware that person B even exists and is affected by their actions. If you can do that, you can then elicit attention. You can begin to start directing attention so that people are paying attention to person B and paying attention to how their behavior affects person B. If you can do that, that begins to enable communication. That in turn enables coordination. Coordination is where a whole lot of new value begins to get created. It's what many traditional companies have been doing. In turn, that enables cooperation. And then you hit this really interesting phase shift here. Because up until that level of cooperation, person A or person B or even both of them might still be putting in more than they're getting out to every episode of engagement. But if you can get over that line to collaboration where there's mutual new benefit being generated, then you get sustainable peace. Because what happens is person A and person B walk into a, a, in an episode of engagement with one unit of new value. They each walk out with one point something units of new value because things got created in the interaction, in the collaboration, in the innovation between them. And a little piece of that new value can be reinvested back in the technology and in the relationship that makes it easier to keep going. And at that point, person A and person B are now more valuable to each other as engagement partners than they are dead. And so all the incentives suddenly shift there. So you can get all the way up to here, and it's pretty easy for things to fall back down again. But if you can get over that line, all the incentives shift towards investing in each other. Yes, please. I was uh, thinking about, uh, is there also, in this uh, um, theory, is a group C outside of us? I mean, normally, today we have the data, we have Facebook. Yeah. People starting arguing on Facebook. But, but if they were argument uh, with each other, they wouldn't have been uh, argument in the first place, but the group will see all their friends. Yeah. Makes the, you know. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, and also in the big world with the F band, etc. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the schematic is deliberately in the form of a dyad to make it grokkable or, or easily understandable for people, but you're absolutely right that, in fact, it's always a network, it's always a constellation, and the complication, the complicated part happens in large networks by increasing the quality of relationship between these two people or those two people, it might actually make them more dangerous to person C. And, and so we do take that very much into account in our theory, but there isn't enough time to go into it in, in detail. I apologize for that. It's an excellent question, an excellent observation. Yeah. Is there something you can hear about young people and have you brought that into where this type of technology, the age you come to learn this process? And the reason I mention this is I went into a school recently and they had, I mean, very simple technology, but a way to make other ch older children aware of the younger children. And if the older child, if the young child has fallen over in the corridor, and the older child then helps that child up with yep. a bag and stuff like that, they get voted as the hero of the day or something yep. like that. So you see some awareness, some attention, there's communication around there, then there's ultimately the older kid gets to look good yep. and does something good for the day the younger kid feels good with being in the school and you have this i can see there's value added in that just just what i'm saying it's absolutely same sort of absolutely what's what you don't have there yet in the in the scenario you described it's definitely positive engagement positive yeah. interaction on that category what you don't have is uh sensor or, or communications or computation happening there and so it's not a technology yet and it's not something that you can start looping into new value creation. But, but basically, as soon as you... So if, if you made that into some kind of an app, for example... An app. They have it oh, app. there is an app. Okay, app. so okay, then there is. Day. Okay, so excellent. It and excellent. They, everyone gets to see that person. Are they also ideally capturing photos or video yeah. or whatever, of it and so on? Okay, so then, then absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a piece of technology. Day. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, the, it, it might not quite be at the collaboration level in terms of measurably extracting, redistributing the new value and reinvesting some of it, but it's, uh, it's certainly up there pretty high on the list. 
If you can do that collaboration thing, and this is what the EU is now extremely interested in with their new Horizon 2020 proposals, that in turn enables collective intelligence and some other interesting emergent possibilities above that. And what I want to say about our lab and the work we do, our research is all focused up here. We think we're affecting this space just by taking energy out of it, basically. But what we're focused on is designing stuff. We're trying to explore the upper limits of that. Um, this is positive but unstable. That's sustainable. I hope that gives you the overall framework, and I apologize, that's normally 20 slides, but instead you're getting it all in one. <laughs> um, so what is Peace Data? Let me just contextualize it a little bit. Most of the data on the internet is machines talking to each other. It's not even people involved. A small chunk of that, these are not in proportion, it would be much smaller. A small chunk of that is human data. A small chunk of that human data is measuring human behavior. A small chunk of that behavior data is measuring social behavior. And a chunk of that social behavior data, most of that social behavior, a large chunk of that, is peace data. Because it tells us something about the quantity or quality of episodes between any person A or group A or part of a person A. Um, and then, for all of you interested in sustainability, uh, this might be where this comes in. Um, our colleagues in Denmark said, wait, does that always have to be two people? Couldn't it be two species? And we had never thought about it that way before. And so they are pioneering an effort now to use the same model and the same framework to build technology that measurably increases positive engagement between any two species on the planet as a way of making the ecosystem more sustainable and also uh, protecting the environment and so forth. So th the framework scales all the way up to that level. We're also um, beginning uh, interesting conversations that I hope will lead to a collaboration with some professors at our medical school about there's this interesting interspecies conflict, a uh, whole category of them that we call infectious diseases. And if you take this model and you start asking, you know, if this is humanity and this is Ebola instead of another person, what would increasing positive engagement look like between us and that species? Because as it turns out, um, almost all infectious diseases, over time, they get milder and milder and milder because they have to in order to survive. And some of them actually begin switching at some point to things that create mutual benefit and it becomes a much better survival strategy. We are all carrying around an example of that in our cells. The part of our cells that creates our cellular energy, which allows us to be alive and function in our oxygen-rich environment. It's called the mitochondria. And uh, according to some evolutionary theories anyways, the, at, at some point that was probably a virus that infected another cell. They're probably two completely different things. It's hard to say, did the other cell eat it or did that cell infect it? But anyway, there was originally a conflict there. They worked it out somehow or other and thank goodness they did because that's what allows us to live. Um, <laughs> So, and, and they worked it out by creating a symbiotic relationship, which gets you back to that mutual benefit level. That's the same thing that kills us too. Yes. Mitochondria. Yes, and um, yeah, it, des it decides when to turn us off, yeah. yeah. Uh, whole other conversation about telomeres. But that's a, that's a really good caution. I, I want to be really sure and really clear that you don't think I'm here um, evangelizing this as some kind of a silver bullet solution to everything. Um, this stuff is complicated. This stuff has the potential for all sorts of unintended consequences. We need very systematic ways to approach it and build it. Um, there are going to be, in, in the same way that when we first started doing aviation, there were plane crashes and people got killed. There are going to be disasters like that. I'm sure of it. It happens with every kind of new technology. Um, that's the stuff that keeps me awake at night and gives me nightmares. For me, the question is, in a similar way to what we did with aviation and what we didn't do with automobiles, we created what we call the International Civil Aviation Organization, which has been devoted since about 1907, I think was the founding meeting, devoted to studying every single airplane crash and saying, we can't stop crashes, but we can at least try to do whatever possible to make sure that that kind of crash doesn't happen again. And as a result of that, aviation has become, if you measure it in passenger miles, 
that's become the safest form of transportation ever by a long, long shot. Whereas the car companies, depending on which conspiracy you want to pay attention to, did not want anybody to do that with car accidents. And so we still have, although there's a famous Swedish car company that did a lot of it themselves, um, but we still have cars. Uh, here's an interesting statistic for you. Guess in which domain we do more physical damage to each other, more, more injury and death every day. It isn't wars. It isn't crime. It's traffic. Yeah. And that says something very nice and very sad about our species at the same time. The nice thing is that the most genocidal, homicidal, megalomaniacal dictators and sociopaths have not been able to kill as many people intentionally as we kill accidentally every day. That's the strange good news about our species. The bad news is we do all this damage to each other with zero intention. Nobody, almost nobody, gets in their car in the morning and says, I'm going to cause an accident today. Um, <coughs> I'm going to hurt somebody today. So zero intention, but the worst results there. I don't know, I'm not quite sure what that says about our species. I'm going to talk very quickly. I'm, I think we're down to three minutes now. <laughs> um, about why we're focused on the business aspect of this. And then I'm going to give a couple examples from the wild that you'll see are, have some problematic aspects, have some troubling aspects, but you'll see examples of peace technologies and, and the kind of value they can create. So, um, traditionally peace has been the domain of either policy and diplomacy or philanthropy and charity. And the uh, fundamental structural problem there is that in, all, in both of those cases the problem is this big and also the opportunity is this big for new value creation, new engagement that didn't exist before and the resources available to address those problems and opportunities are tiny. With policy and diplomacy it's a, a fraction of the taxpayer uh, uh, defense and security budget and with the nonprofit chair, uh, sector, it's a, it's a tiny fraction of foundation wealth. It's, it's whatever the returns they're making back on the, on the principle that they're investing. The second problem is that um, in, in either case, the, the resources are stuck in the middle in global capital markets. And the third problem is there's no way to get them out of there into either policy and diplomacy and issues initiatives or philanthropy and charity initiatives. If you are the director of a pension fund for your country and you have a friend, a politician who has a brilliant, totally well proven and validated um, uh, intervention, but it's in the form of policy and diplomacy, if you try and invest your pension funds into that, what happens to you? you go directly to jail for violating your fiduciary responsibility to your investors. Because there's no prudent man signal there about what you were doing with that money. And that money has to make a return so that those people can afford to retire or that so, so, so those people can afford to have their health insurance, for example. But on the same time, if you are aware of that same brilliant intervention, but it's structured as a nonprofit, it's structured as a, as a charity, the most you can do over there is you can take a tiny percentage of the profits that you're generating from your investments and you can put those in a foundation and then you can reinvest that tiny percentage and then take the interest on that and give it away as grants. And if you are in that space at all, you pay attention to the numbers and you realize that less than 10 nonprofits a year scale to over a million dollars. So it's hard enough to do a startup of any kind. It's hard enough to be an entrepreneur as it is. You are sh shooting yourself in the foot and breaking your other leg if you try and structure your entrepreneurial venture as a nonprofit. It's just a brutal way to do things. So the key thing is, why, why is there no bridge? Because there's no price signal. And what's the issue with global capital markets? If you're that pension fund manager, you have a tidal wave of money behind you. And every day, every minute of every day, you need to be finding good places to put that money that earn a return. And guess what the problem is? 
there are not enough good investments. And you keep feeling like that tidal wave of money is going to crash down on you. Every time somebody puts money in a savings account in the bank, you're just like, uh, more money, I have to find a place to put it. Um, so what we're trying to do, I'll skip, well, I'll touch on this really quickly. What ends up happening in many cases is the pension fund manager says, well, I really want to invest there, but I can't. And that government intervention is lovely, but I can't fund that either. And so what am I going to do? I have this tidal wave of money. OK, Lockheed Martin is making great returns on their cruise missiles. I guess I'll put some money there. You get forced into these kinds of things because there aren't enough good alternatives. We think what you need there to address those structural problems is peace service businesses, for profit peace service businesses, so that we can have a price signal, so that we can say, the price of peace is this, and the value of it is this. That's a buy signal. That's a buy signal that any market investor can understand. Or we can say, the price of peace is this, and the value is this. That's a signal that we need entrepreneurship and innovation in that space. In either case, that's something that the business community can work with. So we are trying to connect global capital markets to these kinds of interventions. That's a little explanation for why business comes into the picture there. OK, so some examples from the real world here. Uh, actually, I'm going to touch very quickly on how we do this process. Um, I won't, I'll touch on this later. I'll skip over this and come back to it later. Um, yeah, sorry. How many of you paid attention to the whole PRISM thing last year, the NSA tapping all your email and phone calls and everything else? OK. Anybody know how much the government budget was for PRISM? It was 20 some million dollars. Which, uh, has anybody ever used government contractor built software before? The user experience is really horrible, trust me on this. <laughs> um, what I want to say here is, there are companies that are spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year to build analytic systems that are really good, really powerful, give you lots and lots of detail, and guess how much they cost you to use? Zero, exactly. It isn't only Facebook, it's Google, it's, it's a bunch of others. There are a bunch of really great analytics services out there that are probably better than anything Prism will ever have, just because they're putting more money into it and they're getting more money out of it as well. These are free for any 13-year-old on, on the planet to, to use, or anybody older than that as well. Um, and they are getting better and better as we go. Um, and here's our examples from the wild very quickly. And we'll touch on the problematic aspects as well. First example, we're going to look at just measurably increasing citizen engagement. Second one, uh, also citizen engagement. Third one, sort of training for civility in some senses. And uh, the last one at the citizen diplomacy level. This is a cool little app called C-Click Fix. Um, it uh, unfortunately was originally structured as a nonprofit, had all those problems, but I think they are uh, fixing that now. Um, basically makes it easy for you to identify things in your community that are broken and let the city know that, hey, there's a pothole in front of my driveway, things, things like that. Hey, the water main is broken over here, et cetera. Um, it increases community engagement in not only in detecting where there are problems that need to be fixed, but it also increases them in terms of uh, there's some collective intelligence here. So you can say, I hate that hole in front of my driveway, but I see that the water system at the school is broken, and so actually I think that the water system at the school is a bigger priority. And then when the city takes three weeks to f come fix your pothole instead of one, now you know why. It's because you helped make the choice that they should allocate their scarce resources elsewhere. So just by increasing transparency and engagement, even though you sometimes have a, a decrease in service delivery as a result of the decisions that people collectively make, there's uh, higher satisfaction with government performance. This was our first experiment with a city lab. This was a little town in um, uh, just outside of Austin, population about 6,000, mostly, mostly impoverished. Um, we set up a virtual online uh, open innovation system for them and uh, looked at uh, how we could help them allocate, again, their scarce resources. These, this was from 2009. Um, those were the results that they got. got 
the White House part was interesting because it really helped to launch the Gov 2.0 movement that is now uh, uh, making public data available to entrepreneurs around the US, which has been a big push towards innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, those numbers are out of date, by the way. It's been used in a lot more than eight now. I should update that slide. So this one's one of the problematic ones. Um, how many of you know what Uber is? The, uh, how many of you can see what the problems are? Okay, we'll come back to that. What's happening here is we're measurably increasing positive engagement across an income disparity gap or across just a, a different set of needs. So people who have a car need a little bit of money. People who don't have a car need a ride. We're using technology to measurably improve positive engagement between those two people. Um, in the process of measurably improving engagement between those two people, here's your question, here's group C, um, the owners of the taxi companies are suddenly being uh, disintermediated quite drastically. So this is fundamental to innovation. Whenever you improve something somewhere, it makes it worse for whoever was the old, uh, the old landlord of that spot. <laughs> um, whoever was extracting rents before suddenly can't extract the same amount of rent. And that, that does create problems. It also uh, had a significant negative impact initially on many cities because many cities had a large chunk of their tax revenue from taxi medallions. Um, which was essentially the, the license that you had to get to operate a taxi every year. They are working some of those things out. I'm not here to evangelize for Uber. I'm just here to say this is a really interesting example of large-scale behavior change and large-scale collaboration. And I want to show you some of those economic results. That valuation is now out of date. It's something over 20 billion now. We'll come back to this because it's indicative of the shift that I was talking about in terms of the shift away from politics towards other kind of powers. Um, there's something really fundamental going on here in terms of being able to change the behavior of hundreds of millions of people in four years that uh, can now be done with software in a way that governments have never been able to do with legal code instead. So um, other example, Airbnb, also some interesting challenges, also disruption for the hotel industry, although they keep saying it isn't and the hotels keep saying it isn't either, but uh, we'll see how that goes. What's really intriguing to us about this, and I think this relates to your projects, Lars, as well, in terms of tourism data, because all of these, everybody's familiar with Airbnb? Do I need to explain that one? Um, if you have a room in your house and somebody else needs a place to stay, uh, you can rent the room to them, and the key thing is you can do this all over an app. Uh, so, so I needed a place to stay in Stockholm over the weekend. I found an apartment on Airbnb and one collapsed there for the weekend, and it was great. Um, the nice thing is because all of these transactions are done over an app, there are all sorts of trust mechanisms that make it really easy for strangers to trust each other. There are some negative side effects of those trust mechanisms. The impact on social bonds when we don't have to work as hard to trust each other is that we don't form as long-lasting or deep or pleasurable friendships. Unintended consequence. But it's there. We do have really rich data that allows us to see, for example, that the friendships aren't lasting as long. But um, the data also tells us about engagement between different cultures, different religions, different genders, uh, different nationalities, different ages. All of that data is the host data. We see all of that data on their side. And, and the, uh, the visitor data, we see all of that. And so we can see all of these episodes of engagement that are mediated by technology. It's made possible in a way that wasn't possible before we had the sensors, the computation, and the communications that make it easy for people to find each other in that context. Economic impact. These are numbers from 2012. These are numbers from 2012 just for New York City, excluding downtown Manhattan. Remember what I said about if you can find something that's working in a city and just improve it a little bit, it can generate lots of new value really quickly. <laughs> 
so part of the challenge with these kinds of disruptive technologies is being sure to take some of the new value that's created, redistribute it to, to each party really quickly, take a little more, reinvest it in making the relationship better, making the technology better, and take a little more yet and reinvest it in undisrupting the people you're disrupting, helping them transition to something else instead. Um, Airbnb is having some interesting legal issues right now in New York City. I don't know if you've been following that. Um, every one of these kinds of technologies is so, um, it's causing such a big shift in the way we do things that the legal code has not been able to keep up. Policy has not been able to keep up. We're having to do, and in many cases, finance hasn't been able to keep up. We're having to do innovation in all of those sectors just to keep up with what technology is allowing us to do. Okay. So, how are we scaling up our work? We have um, a lot of resources at Stanford, but one of the resources we don't have, we're actually a small university. And uh, it's, first of all, we don't have enough researchers to be able to send them to cities around the world. Second of all, we uh, would have to pay them considerably more than if we just hire people locally to work with us on this. Um, so we have developed a strategy of building partner labs in cities. And the city focuses for two reasons. The one we touched on earlier, this is actually where most human violence is going to be in the next three decades, four decades. But the other is, with our traditional nation-state conflicts that we have normally been thinking the opposite of peace is war, and, and usually war is between nation-states, we have a little bit of good news there, but it's bad news if you're an academic researcher. The good news is there are not very many wars left in the world today. They're getting less and less and less every year. The, the, the trend line is a little bit bumpy, but it's going consistently down. Um, Last year, there were 17 militarized conflicts in the world. And uh, that, if you're an academic, is a disaster because there's not a large enough sample size. And no matter how much I negotiate with my bosses, with the Institutional Review Board, they will not allow me to start wars just so that we can study them. They just won't go for that. So, um, but if we work with cities instead, we get our sample size back. And this allows us to do the other very important thing that I mentioned. These, these kinds of technologies are dangerous. They do have unintended consequences. And it's probably impossible, impossible to predict exactly when and where those unintended consequences will occur. And so one of the ways we can systematically deploy these kinds of things in a safer way anyways is by um, very systematically studying what works and what doesn't work across a large sample size. And when we discover interesting things that seem to be working, instead of deploying one big test that might be disastrous, deploying 500 tiny tests that are each slightly different so that we, get, uh, we can do effectively randomized controlled field trials to validate that the intervention really is working and also how well it's working and how much it costs and in what circumstances and which circumstances it doesn't work. But also, if we discover some kind of unintended consequence in one of those tiny trials, it's a lot easier to shut it down before it impacts a lot of people's lives. Does that make sense? So I, I, I really want everybody to be clear that um, I'm excited about this work, but I'm also terrified. And I think this is the, the smart approach for anybody who is examining the kind of things that are now possible to build with technology um, anybody who's not terrified is crazy, but also anybody who's not excited is crazy. And so we have to get used to this sort of cognitive tension because we've just, we've taken our ability to do harm to each other and our ability to do good to each other and we've increased the delta hugely in both directions. And fortunately, as I said before, there's a little bit of a tilt to the positive, but it's still, it has increased significantly in both directions. Um, so the first thing is whenever anybody asks you, um, are these technologies good or bad, please start telling them that's just a naive question. That's just the wrong question. These technologies are, you should either think of them as more or less neutral and what people will do with them will be good or bad, or you should think of them more likely as all of these things have costs and benefits. Nobody wants to pay the costs, but the costs are there. Everybody loves the benefits. The benefits usually come with the cost. And we should be looking, instead of asking, is it good or is it bad, we should be saying, 
what part is good, in what way is it good, what part is bad, how much does the bad part cost, is it worth it to do these things? That's a more rational approach that everybody needs to be taking. Don't get lost in the argument of good versus bad. Assume that they're both, please. All right, um, let me jump through the... Three things in this part. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're scaling up in cities around the world. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, value of innovation and specifically the kind of large-scale collaborative innovation that we do as our process. And we'll talk about, um, I'll just give a little bit of credentials so that you know that we're not just talking through our hats here. We actually know something at Stanford about how to do this. Then we'll talk about how even though what we're doing in Silicon Valley right now is seems to be more or less uh, a more effective innovation process than anybody else is doing anywhere else in the world. Um, it's still not nearly as good as it could be, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, last of all, we'll fly through and, and look at um, how we could work together to have a Peace Innovation Lab um, here, and what that might look like, and, and what the benefits would be for you. Uh, I don't know if I can get through this, but we'll try. Um, sorry, this was uh, for The Hague and I didn't get a chance to change the... Uh, this was from a couple weeks ago. Uh, that should say, your city. So we're looking for economic and social development, both, and we're looking for a measurable, scalable, and sustainable. The, um, those episodes of positive engagement that we were talking about before, that on the graph, that they measurably create positive value. Anybody know what we call that stuff? especially when it gets over the collaboration level and people have mutual benefit. We have a really simple, really old word for it. Win-win. Win-win is, is the outcome. Win-win is how feel, people feel about it afterwards. Those can be a little bit dangerous, by the way. We have to keep checking the data to make sure it's still a win-win. I can give you a bunch of examples of unintended consequences there. But no, we have an old, a really old word for this. How many people are business people? One of the old words is business. It's just good business. The other old word is trade. And so what I want you to see here is there's the possibility for business people who have often been cast as the villains in the world to be able to measure how much good they're creating, how much new value they're creating, how much impact that's having. And in the process of measuring it, being able to tweak the design of their business to deliver more of those things at, at less social cost. So this part is embarrassing for me. Please, please uh, bear with me. Um, this is where we have to sh show a little bit for most people that we actually know what we're doing with innovation at Stanford. And it's doubly embarrassing for me because I'm not an American. I just work at an American university, although these days I mostly seem to live in airports. What you have here is um, blue dots are alumni of the university. In this case, this is MIT. And this is uh, inter-university alumni networks that have created new technology businesses that have played a key role in a new technology business. Blue dots are alumni. Red dots are startups that they played a role in. Everybody assumes that MIT is the best in the world at this, per capita or in total. In fact, Berkeley is better. And by contrast, this is Harvard. And what I want you to see is, this is us. We do more technology startups than all three of them combined. And more successful ones. The economic value of that, anybody want to guess? If you took the annual gross revenue of all Stanford alumni startups, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> GDP of Sweden. More. 500 billion. Two trillion. You're getting close. <laughs> the network that I just showed you of startups, that's annual gross revenues of that network. The number of jobs that have been created, as you're saying, a lot of this just comes down to employment and how much can we create new jobs and so on. 
That's our track record. If you gather those collectively into an independent nation, Stanford would be the 10th largest economy in the world. The reason this is painful for me is, does anybody know what the 10th largest economy in the world actually is? Happens to be my country. So my country and my university have the same economic impact in terms of new wealth creation. So it sounds like we do it really well. And I don't want to say we do it badly. I just want to say there are some problems with the way we do it. The current model of innovation, the way we do it in Silicon Valley, is based on what we call the treasure hunt, which you should think of, you should think of a map. And here we have the frontier, and down here is the known world. And up here is the unknown. Terra incognita. This is the, the desert. And the venture capital model works something like this. A venture capitalist says, OK, I'm going to fund 10 teams to go explore the desert. I'm going to fund 10 very different diverse teams. We're going to start with a hypothesis, a hypothesis that somewhere out here, this is my attempt to draw palm trees, somewhere out here is an oasis, and we're going to send those 10 teams out to explore the desert and find the oasis. But it's a treasure hunt model because those 10 teams, each of them has a different theory of where the, where the oasis should be and how to find it, and each of them uh, starts off, the, the venture capitalist gives them some funding, and off they go in their, in their different directions looking for the oasis. And statistically, we've figured out over time that there's a pretty good chance that you know, one of them will actually find the oasis, and the other nine teams will die in the desert, and we'll never hear, or see from, hear from them or see them again. That's more or less the way we're doing innovation currently in the valley. And the thing is, you can make enough money from that one in 10 discovery that it pays all the costs of all the stuff that you never see again. The problem is, you never see it again. Because what's most valuable in the desert, since it is the desert of the unknown, it's silly to start with the assumption that we know that the oasis is the most valuable asset out here. What's most valuable is what's out there, just the knowledge of what's out there, and specifically, nine parts of the value you're creating here is knowledge about what doesn't work. One part of the knowledge you're creating is value about what does work. The nine parts about what doesn't work, if you could get that knowledge back here so that you knew why those people died in the desert, you could save a whole lot of other people falling off the same cliffs and dying in the same places. Do you see what I mean? So it creates um, tremendous waste that knowledge, the relevant knowledge that is most needed is, is knowledge about what doesn't work. Nine-tenths of the data, roughly, is what you need to know is about where not to go, what not to do, what doesn't work. And that, in turn, creates really flawed opportunity perception. So we see again and again in the valley, and I'm simplifying this, but we see startups that could have um, done something really easy, but they thought it was a really hard problem because the knowledge didn't get to them that somebody had already solved that problem. And so they avoided that whole opportunity. And we see other startups that bang their head on a wall and, and essentially commit suicide on a really hard problem that they thought was really easy because they never got the knowledge back that 50 startups had already died trying to do that exact thing. Mm -hmm. And so they're repeating the mistakes of others. And that's where a huge amount of waste comes in. So what we're proposing instead is a map making model rather than a treasure hunting model. So in our labs, we line up six or seven teams exactly one kilometer apart on the edge of the desert, metaphorically speaking. And we send them all in exactly one kilometer and they drill a social probe one kilometer in. And that social probe is a quick prototype that they do and they say at these coordinates on the map we discovered these things.
and we're just resourcing them to map the desert. And so they do it again, and again, and again. And at some point, as we continue that process, we begin to build up a picture of the unknown. And that knowledge about the unknown itself, we think, is the most valuable asset. It's that shared map of the possibility space that we think generates the most savings in the long run because it allows that nine-tenths of the knowledge about what doesn't work to save people a whole lot of waste. It means that we can afford to resource those teams to just keep exploring and keep mapping the desert. It also means that when one of them discovers something really interesting here, we can suddenly have all the other teams swarm around this. We can move down to a 100 meter resolution or a 10 meter resolution and we can start honing in really quickly on what works and what doesn't work and why and how in that space. I'll share the slides with you later. You're, you're welcome to take pictures of them also, but I'll, I'll leave these behind. Um, and hopefully that says enough about why we're doing it this way right there. Does that make enough sense that I can just go on to other things? Yeah. So what that means though is these teams are collaborating. They're not competing. And that's a fundamental shift from the model. These guys are drilling a social probe and they're immediately reporting to the other teams what they discovered. So this is going on not only in our lab where we have six or seven design teams working together to do this, and I'll go into much more detail about that process, but it's going on between our labs as well. So we're mapping the desert with many, many other labs. Over time, that number increases. Six or seven teams in each lab, we discover a lot. Uh, we're also, this social probe process, that takes a well-trained team about half an hour or less to go another kilometer in and drill another probe, basically. So we're able to map the possibility space, map the design space very, very quickly in terms of improving the relationship between any two stakeholders. That's the design space we're most interested in. And in the process, improving new value creation between those two stakeholders. Making sense so far? Do there need to be very like uh, the companies, the startups do they have to share the same base? Or? Could it be diversity, shoe company? Uh, no. no, so we are, th that's another key difference. Um, that is the traditional model, diversity. So, so if you get uh, accepted into Y Combinator or Techstars or one of those incubators at the moment, and those are great incubators doing great work, by the way. Um, but if you get it accepted, you can be sure that no other company in the cohort will be doing the thing you're doing. They're working on the traditional investment model, which is diversify risk. And so they want 10 very different companies doing 10 very different things. The other problem with that is they're effectively, it's, it's not even the treasure hunt model the way I do it. It's even worse because, in fact, they're sending one team per desert in 10 different deserts is what's actually happening. Um, and, and so it's very hard to share knowledge. Uh, across those teams. They're all in the same incubator together. They're, they're able to share general knowledge about business practices, that kind of thing, but specific knowledge about the, the problem space or the opportunity space, they're all in different opportunity spaces. So it's very hard for them to do that. Our teams are not trying to discover... Uh, uh, we've structured this for collaboration so that our teams are not trying to do a startup in that sense. And they're not trying to do a startup in competition with the other teams, where one of them hopefully will be funded at the end of the cohort. Um, they are instead trying to create a process that generates new products, new services, and sometimes new ventures uh, in a consistent way every 10 weeks together. We think, by the way, we're sort of stuck in the 10-week pattern just because at Stanford we're in 10-week quarters. Um, we have a lot of evidence now that we could do this in a lot shorter period of time, maybe two weeks or three weeks as well. I haven't had a chance to explore that yet. Um, again, the other big benefit here is when we discover that interesting thing that seems to work, we can also do those randomized controlled field trials to really quickly validate that it really does work. 
and at what cost and under what circumstances and uh, what are the uh, required contexts and, and so forth. So we're able to get through the startup cycle a lot faster, we think. And I, I should just, I guess, maybe emphasize one other thing about that, if I can get my slide back. Um, the shared focus and the coordinated scheduling. The shared focus particularly, what we have is every quarter, all of the labs in the network run a little collective intelligence process together in the first week of the quarter. And we decide what's the biggest opportunity in our city. And all the labs together choose the same one. So it's not only that we have six or seven teams all focused on the same opportunity, it's that we have all the labs in the network for that quarter focused on the same opportunity. Because we're working on the assumption that whatever you can learn in one city will probably be pretty applicable and pretty relevant in other cities. It allows us to do a lot of cross-fertilization, cross-pollinization. Making sense? Yeah. Okay, so a little bit about what's involved here. Labs fulfill five functions in one. First of all, new innovation training facility. We're teaching this kind of collaborative, large-scale, um, coordinated innovation process. It's a new type of incubator. Again, we're focused on earlier stage entrepreneurship than traditional incubators. Traditional incubators, you already have to have a team. You usually have to have a prototype as well. We think that that model uh, can be improved by um, uh, making the entry funnel earlier, basically. So we just bring in a diverse group of members from the community. And once we've identified an opportunity theme for the quarter, that group of members from the community is working on designing technology for their community, by their community, to measurably improve something about their community. And all we care about, we don't care if it leads to a new startup venture, we just care can we generate new products or services for the community. And if we get some new ventures out of that as well, great. But we have a bunch of industry sponsors from the community who just want new products and services. And so any new startups that come out are icing on the cake. Making sense there? So we're in an earlier stage of the innovation process. And this is part of what we're seeing with entrepreneurship and innovation is uh, 30 years ago, if you wanted to start a company, it was a lot of work, a lot of effort. And, and if you wanted to scale that, it was even more work and more effort. Over the last 10 years, we've seen the cost of starting a company get cheaper and cheaper, and, and the speed with which you can start a company get faster and faster, and the ease with which you can start a company, um, the, the difficulty has been decreasing and decreasing as well. The result is, we saw this shift about seven years ago in the Valley, um, where the way I was raised to do business before in my previous career, um, you always came with a business plan. If you didn't have a business plan, you weren't serious. And if you hadn't done you know, several months of marketing research and so on, nobody took you seriously. In about 2005, 2006, the Valley started changing and saying, if you're coming to me with a business plan, I won't fund you. Because that's proof that you're an idiot. Because you could have done 20 prototypes in the time that you were doing your planning. And with your 20 prototypes, you'd actually know something instead of just having a theory. So one of the results of it getting so cheap and so easy to test is that the whole space of entrepreneurship has become much more empirical. And funders will not fund plans in many cases anymore because they want to see empirical results instead. And they want to see that you can do really fast experimentation. Because exp they're assuming now that we're in a world that is just changing faster and faster. Please. Uh, who can be a member of this, those teams? So for us, what we're mainly concerned about is a really diverse representation of the community. So we're looking for retired people, kids, um, moms, and, and then working professionals in there as well. We'd like students. But what we really want is a diverse representation of the community. Different cultures, different ethnicities. Um, the process maxes out at about eight, maximum 21 people. Um, 18 people is an ideal number. We work in teams of three. I'll get to that detail a little later. I'm sorry, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay, startup incubator. The kind of entrepreneurship that it's possible to do is now possible to do it much faster, but also smaller scale. So you don't need to start a company in many cases anymore. You can just create a product or a service. 
and you can hand that product or service right off to a company that already has marketing channels, a company that already has business development, a company that already knows how to do all that stuff and can do it better than you anyway. So it's, it's even pre-acquisition. You don't even bother to start a company to get acquired. You just extrapreneur with, with products and services. New kind of accelerator. The accelerator part here is it's one lab in a whole network of city labs. And because we're able to do that comparative analysis across all those city labs, and because we're running a coordinated collaborative process across all those city labs, you get all sorts of network benefits of new knowledge creation faster as a result. Last but, sorry, not last, number four, for all the academics in the room, and this is for me the, one of the most fun parts, it is a controlled research environment. We're actually studying the innovation process. By the time we get 10 years out, we will have the biggest and the longest longitudinal study of the innovation process ever. And that should keep going indefinitely if this works out well. So um, it, it is a rigorous scientific study of the innovation process at a scale that has never been done before. It lets us see the differences that cultures, age, gender, all these other things uh, make in terms of people's ability to innovate together. I find that part fascinating. Um, last but not least, what we have is a really agile funding methodology. How many of you are academics? How many of you have had to work on the grant cycle? What's the fastest time you've ever been able to go from idea to proposal to funding to experiment to publishing? What's the shortest time anybody's ever done that? The best experience you've had? Somebody? Probably too long time since it takes time to think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's typically at least, at least a year, often, often more. And when you're talking about being able to run prototypes and see the results within an hour or two, uh, waiting a year to get funding for that before you can do another cycle is crazy. So we're really focused on um, really agile funding that begins to match the speed at which we can now do knowledge creation in academia. I apologize that these slides are largely just blocks of text, but um, let's dive into these. Let's start with the first one, new kind of innovation training facility. We're taking the best practices that we have in the Valley and benchmarking them globally. We are entirely focused on project-based learning and it's all about community co-design. I really should emphasize and underline and italicize and bold that. Obviously, if we come here to your city, we know nothing about your city, right? Isn't, I mean, that's so obvious, right? Um, we know something about a collaborative innovation process and we know something about rigorous academic research and we know something about um, innovation in general and we know nothing about this community. And so the only way that this kind of thing can be done ethically is if members of the community are bringing the expertise about the community, members of the community are doing the design process for themselves um, with us just coaching on how to do this kind of innovation. Really? Five minutes? Ah! <laughs> um, okay. We think that co-design process is the only way to do this ethically. Um, okay, we're not going to get through this. I will try though. Okay. I'm going to skim this stuff and let you guys read it from the decks if you want. But basically, what's unique about the incubator is, again, the focus on products and services rather than ventures. We do turn out some new ventures, but uh, um, it's mainly products and services. I think I've actually covered most of this. The w one of the ways we're um, maximizing collaboration is that all the participants in each cohort, we actually start a holding company for those participants. The lab owns a little bit of the company and all the participants own a little bit of that company. And then every product and service and venture that comes out of that cohort belongs to that company. So we're trying all sorts of systems to maximize collaboration and minimize hoarding. Um, this part is really crucial. It turns out that the design skills that you need in a team um, Traditionally, teams have, uh, startup teams have what we call a, a suit and a hoodie, basically. So, uh, the business guy, you know, and the coder, the software developer. 
Um, if they're lucky, they also have a, a beret on that team. That's the designer, okay? But many of them never think to get a designer involved. So, but it turns out that you also need some other skill sets there. One of the other skill sets is you need people who really understand business models. And those guys are expensive. And they're typically getting very well paid at consulting firms. So what we do is we bring them in once a quarter and we optimize a business model that we know will work that quarter. And then everything we do for that quarter is built on that business model. That improves our, that de-risks the process significantly, improves our chances of success. Um, and then we're specializing, but we're specializing within the incubator itself, not within the individual teams. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We're basically bringing professional coders uh, to the table from our business partners, and then we hand off the, the projects to those business partners as well for business development. So those are the other two skills, or sorry, that's one of the other skills you need is business development. Um, okay. I think we pretty much covered this over here. That's how the acceleration part works. That's why we're able to get better acceleration than traditional, uh, traditional accelerators who are not working in a network. And... Can I ask you a little bit please. about validation? Tell us more about the validation. The validation process? Yeah. It's the randomized controlled field trials? Yeah. So, so if you have... Um, if across the whole network you have uh, if you've discovered something interesting here and you very quickly do 500 different variants of this in 500 different cities and you do 200 of them with a control condition, 100 of them with uh, a variable condition or, or another 200 with a variable condition and then 100 you leave alone and you don't do anything, um, you can very quickly determine if you're really seeing what you think you're seeing or not. Does that make sense? And so it moves things away from anecdote and the ability of the, the business guy to tell a good story, it moves it towards something much more empirical. Okay. I guess we have to just keep flying through this if we're going to, okay, three minutes, okay. <laughs> um, Mark, yes? Well, I, th I think we I think we've sort of talked about this in some detail anyways. I, I, I preluded a little bit, but um, the way we're funding this is industry partnerships. So we come to a city, we identify who the business stakeholders are who benefit most from peace, and also who the business stakeholders are who are most exposed to violence in the community. Anybody want to guess which industry is most exposed both ways? It's one industry that is benefits the most with more peace and also feels the pain more than anybody with more violence. No, at a city level. Let me explain how the process works to you. If you have increased violence in a neighborhood, what happens? People start moving out of that neighborhood and other people don't want to move into that neighborhood to live there. When that happens, what happens to house prices? they start dropping. When house prices start dropping and people start moving out, what's the next thing that happens? The businesses in that neighborhood have fewer customers and the customers they have don't have as much money. And to employ people to come into that neighborhood, they have to now spend more money because people don't want to work there either. What happens when that happens? The people who are still left there as employees or living there for whatever reason, they suddenly have less disposable income because less income in the community, because less work, less employment in the community as a result of it. Who do you suppose is most impacted by those three changes? Exactly. Banks are hit harder than anybody else. Their mortgage portfolio should be worth this and suddenly it's worth this. Their business loan portfolio should be worth this and suddenly it's worth this. And their consumer loan portfolio should be like this and suddenly it's got all these defaults. It's also three different kinds of pain. It hits their collateral value. Obviously, that's the part we just talked about. It also hits their loan fees, which is their operating revenue in most cases. It also hits their fractional reserve lending ratio, which means, 
I won't go into the details of that, but it basically means if, you if your assets are suddenly worth less, you can't write as many loans, and if you've written loans based on asset valuation of this much, and now your asset valuation is this much, you have to call in a bunch of the loans you've written, and you start getting credit freeze as a result of that in a community. Guess what the good news is? Banks have money. Banks have a line item in their budget for risk management. And they don't know that some of these kinds of things are available to help them manage those risks. They don't know that we can now measure that kind of thing at that level of precision. So there's a big opportunity there. But guess what else? So the nice thing is, and I have to tell you, you know, six years ago, when I started having a conversation with bankers, if I talked to the CEO and I mentioned the word peace, he would say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know how you got here. You must be wanting to talk to the foundation side of the bank because this is the business part. <laughs> um, now I can have a conversation and in five minutes I can explain to him why this is vital to their business. And you start that conversation by talking about risk management. But guess what the second part is? investment opportunities. Yes, if you can drive positive engagement, banks are more exposed to an increase in positive engagement in a community than anybody else. They benefit more than anybody else does. So all the pain aggregates up to them, but most of the benefit aggregates up to them as well. Um, in the process, they're able to then turn around and start reinvesting in the community. So, yes? A question related to that, because when you ask the question about what is the, the fastest time, like you have seen it, found the idea or something. I, I was thinking directly that, okay, the incremental ideas are usually the fastest ones because they're easy to describe. The destructive one, they are diffi difficult to describe. You don't know what you don't know. Yep. So therefore they are by definition difficult. And for these banks, what, what are they tending to do? They, do they tend to uh, reinvest in the incremental uh, ideas or do they spend the money on the destructive? We're seeing more and more of a trend with banks to want a little piece of what has been traditionally the venture capital sector. Um, they want to be able to do it in a de-risked way. But um, so for example, you should just do this experiment yourself. Look at the number of banks in Sweden that now have an innovation lab inside the bank, that now have a director of innovation or even a, a chief innovation officer. That was unimaginable 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's kind of a trend out there now. They're looking really hard at how to innovate around financial services, and so a lot of what they reinvest in is around um, uh, new services that they can offer their customers, obviously. Um, but new customer acquisition is big for them, too. Both of those things are about measurably increasing positive engagement. Yeah. So banks are not by any means the only ones who are exposed. They're just the biggest one. And again, the good news for funding this stuff is banks have money, but so do the other two um, industries that are the main part of the first business framework that we have, banks are essentially the demand side and financial services in general, insurance and some other things are also obviously impacted. The telecoms, the network providers and the handset manufacturers and basically everybody who's building sensors or deploying sensors somewhere, um, those people are the middlemen. They're creating the market. And then anybody who's building any kind of social software over here that's the supply side. That's where the data is coming from, where we can measure, can you design an intervention over here that changes behavior? Can we measure the value of that over here? Can we get these guys to pay for that? Can we get the guys in the middle who are making that market to get a piece of it? That makes sense as an overall business framework. That's the first model. We think there's three or four other ones there as well, but we started with that one because that's where the resources are right now. What that means is we can offer quarterly funding for each cohort from the business partners some money coming in from them, some guarantees to buy what comes out on the back end at the end of the quarter, some um, skills from them as well. Uh, they're, they're typically, so for example, our software developers, we're not saying to our members of the community, oh, you have to be a software developer. We're saying, we'll teach you a rapid prototyping process that is a paper prototyping process, and twice a day we hand the best of those designs to two software developers that our industry partners have sent to the room to build a functional prototype from that. Um, we're also saying you don't have to be a business expert. You just have to be able to help us identify what the community wants, what the community needs, what the community would like, and get us some insights into the design, how it needs to work for the community. And then 
the, those same business partners will use their channels, their markets, et cetera, to get that out there and deployed. I think I am beating this. Um, as I said, typically, um, your startup team has this guy and this guy, the suit and the hoodie, basically. Um, if they're lucky, they have a designer as well. What we're doing is saying there are three other roles that really matter. You need um, the business model experts. I talked about them already. You really need engaged users. This is really crucial. Most, company, most startup companies have, end up having to pay a bunch of users to be their first users to actually work with their product. But in order to do this iterative innovation process, you need to be able to have continual conversations with people who will be patient enough with your product that they will say, it's crap, and this is why, and this is how, and this is what you need to do to fix it, etc. And you need to be able to have that conversation with them a thousand times to get something good out of that. And so currently, people have to pay a lot of money for that. And then one of the things you look at in a startup budget is how much are you paying per head for your beta users? What we have here is members of the community who are designing for the community and the network of people around them that they're pushing their prototypes out to who are also members of the community who are much more engaged because it's building something for them. And so user acquisition costs go way down here. That chunk of the budget goes way down. I talked about these guys. These are our companies. Again, these two guys are, are coming from our companies. Our communities are also functioning as the designer. So they're designing something for themselves, by themselves again. This is a part that's really often forgotten in any startup team. If, if you're lucky, you know, probably this guy was at university doing research when he had his business idea. But if you're not lucky, they never enter the equation. We're bringing local universities to the table to help with that as well. Uh, da -da, da -da. That's more detail about what we just covered. I think I basically just repeated myself there. This is what a lab schematically looks like, except that the researchers should be on one side or the other as well. I'm sorry, the researchers are not in the picture here yet. Uh, we have, at the beginning of the quarter, the business modeling team standardizes the business model. We have six tables with teams of three at those tables. We do a design sprint that I'll show you in a second here. At the end of that design sprint, we rotate the team membership. So by the end of the cohort, at the end of the quarter, you have probably worked several times with every other combination of other people in the room on one, at least one of these prototypes. Um, then we have our developers sitting over here. We're handing off the best of those prototypes to them twice a day at noon and in the evening. They're coding up backends for that. And they're handing off those to the business development people, again, our industry partners who have the channels in place already. It's not like any traditional innovation model you've seen before. There, there's nobody else doing this kind of large-scale collaborative process. And there's nobody else saying, maybe we shouldn't have teams that it's their startup from beginning to end. Um, so, so those are some of the key differences here. These members of the community are fulfilling all those roles um, with support, with professional support from the outside. That's effectively what's happening. All right, um, that's a little overview of the, we spend a week preparing. We spend 10 weeks doing the, the prototyping process, which I'll show you in a second. And then we spend uh, the 12th week um, op reviewing and optimizing the process, and then repeating it quarterly. <coughs> Those are development phases. Huh. I'm missing, sorry. This was the slides from the previous deck that I said I would show you later. Hold on. That, development pro um, that prototyping process, let me just pull it up again. So you'll see some, some correlation here to the loop over there. We we've identified together with the members of the community two target, commu two target communities or groups or, or entities that we're going to work on improving the relationship between. And again, we're starting at the top. We're starting with what's already working really well. Can we improve that by a couple of percent? We start out looking at a technology that they're already using because that's where they already are. We don't have to train them again. That's our low-hanging fruit. In the end, we eventually get around to designing new applications for them, but we pick the low-hanging fruit first. We choose a tiny. How many of you are familiar with the phrase minimum viable product from the Valley? So when you're doing a startup, it turns out that you don't want to build the perfect thing. You want to build the most basic thing that you can get somebody to pay you for, and then you want to start having a conversation with that person about how to make it better, rather than trying to make it perfect before you give it to them. 
key part of the successful innovation process, we are focused on minimum viable behaviors. Everything we do is around um, behavior design and designing technology to elicit those behaviors. And so we're interested in the tiniest behavior you can get from that person and the behavior still makes a difference. And we build a whole library of software that elicits that behavior and then we can start chaining those together, those little subroutines, into much more complex behaviors. We create really fast prototypes and push them out into the world. I don't have time to go into that, uh, how we do that, but that's kind of where the secret sauce is. And then the key thing is you've got to be able to measure the impact of that. And then based on the impact, you either optimize or you pivot. And do the loop again. So a quick example of what it looks like. For Cairo, for example, communities happen to be the cops and the Salafis in Cairo. Technology they're already using, we start with the low easy stuff because this is also part of our training process for teaching people in the community how to do this. So the training wheels are starting with existing technologies. In this case, Facebook. Positive behavior. Can you take a photo of yourself with one of your friends from that other group just to show that you can get along with them and they get along with you? And the fast prototype intervention, in this case a Facebook page where people are posting those photos. Let's see how many of those we can get. Push that prototype out. Typically, we let it bake for an hour. Basically, we go on and do another loop while we wait for this one to see what kind of results we get here. We're not looking for perfect academically publishable results here. We're just looking for enough interaction with the real world, with, in this case, Cairo and those two communities, to get a sense of do we have something here or not? Are we onto something or not? Can we, we're just looking for enough data to make a decision about should we keep going and improve this or should we try something different, basically. Yeah, or sometimes you, you have 20 likes and 20 comments and, you, and the comments are interesting enough that you say, okay, there's something interesting there, we should keep doing it. So we're looking for small signals because we're only going to invest another half hour at a time. So this process, we're typically running a half hour at a time. Um, you can do the math then, six teams, eight hours a day, call it six hours of prototyping, two prototypes an hour, two of those going to more development with the development communities. Yeah, and I think actually that's, that's pretty much it, we'll end there. Questions and answers? I'm going to ask the questions, you guys give me the answers? No, okay. <laughs> So, so we're open questions. Just use so, that. Hopefully, there's some seeds that's been planted here um, for, for this. So, uh, huh? I guess one question: What if there are any seeds that are planted and, and start to grow here? Or how should the process look like? Let's say we we like to start a, a lab there. What's the process? Let's go back to that one. That gets things started. Find the industry partners, get them in the room, have a conversation with them about how this process can be valuable for them. Um, in the process, they get triple bottom line, they get good PR, they get good CSR, um, not to mention good marketing and increased customer loyalty, customer engagement. Um, I I'm really pleased to see the number of you guys that are working on gamification or coming from game companies or that kind of thing. And um, yeah, so, okay, so this gets the process started. You start building the community. Sorry, I'm going the wrong direction here. Um, we think there's probably more like 10 steps to the development process, so imagine a couple steps in between here. But um, basically, we've pretty much now done step one already. Step two is we'd come back and do a workshop where we, it would be a sample. Uh, think of it as a hackathon. We're basically saying, if you had a lab here, we're going to do for two days together what you'd be doing eight hours a day in the lab here five days a week. And that gets the community a chance to feel the process, experience the process, and it gets the sponsors a chance to see the kind of stuff that comes out with 18 completely untrained people. In two days, we can begin to show interesting results already. Um, once we've done that, then probably either a longer workshop where we actually move towards having functional prototypes come out as well as some training for the community or, or a class with the local university. One or the other of those probably works. And then uh, this is 
looking for, and like I said, there's probably a few more interim steps to get to this, but what we're, what we're looking for is uh, a functional lab operating uh, a regular 40-hour work week. Oh, I'm sorry, what's the work week in Sweden? It's not 40 hours, is it? It is 40 hours? Okay. The, it's, is it the Danes, or who has the 36-hour work week? I think, I think Denmark has something less than 40 as well. I said 40 hours and they looked at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> Does that answer that question? Other questions? Yes. Thanks. Who will be the stakeholder for the, uh, the lab? Who will be the, uh, the responsible organization in this region? We typically have a personal relationship rather than a group or organizational relationship. We're, we're looking to work with somebody that we know and trust. Or, and then what we quickly want to see is how, how well can they build a team around them quickly. So uh, um, I'll work with people who can show me that they can do this, basically. Uh, and I should clarify, I guess, the next question is usually, is there only one lab per city? And my answer to that is, there, is there only one cafe in your city or only one restaurant, you know? This is a business process. It creates new value. As many of these as the market demands, there should be. So, you know, we can go down to the neighborhood level very easily. What kind of other resources do you need? I mean, uh, you're talking about 18 people employed full time? Ideally, eight, eight hours. I, ideally they're employed or else you have some sort of arrangement where they're they're paid a stipend, plus they're getting equity from the company. Um, something like the current incubator models where, where, you know, Y Combinator, for example, says, we'll incubate your company. You're getting basically pizza money enough to stay alive. Um, but you're getting tremendous support to build equity in your company at the same time. That's, that's one model. The other model is we have 18 students in there. Um, and, and they are there for the grade, basically, but there for the real world results as well. Um, another model is you start with volunteers and, and you just say you're doing a startup but it's 18 of you doing a startup together. It's, it's also about four support staff by the way so if you add those in you should add them into the budget. And, and process leading this or uh, is that one person or is it? It's usually two. Uh, we're organizing a certification course. We have been going out and certifying people. Um, one of the reasons I'm so tired is because we've maximized our ability to do that and so now we are uh, reversing our process and we're bringing people to Stanford to train them there and certify them. So um, the other part of the answer to your question of who do we like to work with, once somebody says yes I'm interested I want to do this, one of the first things we want to do is say okay I'm sorry Stanford is an elite expensive private university, it costs six thousand dollars to come and be certified to be able to organize this in the community. Is there any other cost involved? What we want to see is that you can raise that money yourself. I typically don't want people paying it out of their own pocket because I'm looking for entrepreneurs. And so I want to see, you know, can you get the funding to um, pay the certification fee and pay your way to Stanford and be there for a week to do this? If you can do that, you're a pretty good candidate already. Then the other costs are, yeah, obviously you've got to get the business partners involved. You need a facility of some kind. Typically, um, you can start out not with your own facility. Uh, one of those tech sponsors or one of those corporate sponsors will often say, hey, you can use our space while you get started. Um, sometimes a university with an incubator already will say, hey, we have an incubator here, we'd like to run this process in it. Um, but somehow or other, yeah, you need to budget for space, you need to budget for uh, a little bit of equipment. It is a controlled research environment. We're filming everything that happens in that environment. And those researchers are sitting behind the scenes in motion coding, the interaction between the design teams and so on. And, um, uh, sorry, there's emotion coding, there's gesture coding, there's a bunch of other things. So we are studying the innovation process as well. That equipment takes a little bit to set up and operate. Um, spec sheet on that? Not yet, but it's coming. Yeah. Yes? Oh, sorry, I thought, well, thought was a hand raised. Other questions? Are there any specific software involved or licensing fees for... That yes, there's a there's an annual licensing fee as well. Um, it I think it's currently twenty five thousand US. Um, I actually have to check on the details of that. I'm in the middle of renegotiating that agreement with Stanford itself at the moment. So, yeah. 
how many labs are there today around the world? So we don't, have, we don't have any yet that are functioning at this level. We've done this at Stanford several times. One of, one of the companies that came out of an earlier version of this is Instagram. You may have heard of them. Um, but um, we, don't, uh, we don't currently have any that are operating full time, 12 weeks a quarter. What we do have is, I think, 21 or 22 now, where we have done um, somewhere up to here, basically. And uh, The Hague is about to go to here. So, yeah. So it's very much, I, we basically opened this up to the world um, 18 months ago, 19 months ago, and, and started going out to those cities and doing this process with them. So that's the stage we're at now. Yeah. Sorry, I should be very clear about that, that this is all in development. Yeah. When did your airplane leave? Uh, when does the airplane leave? Yeah, we have to break now. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm the driver. Oh, you're the, okay. So, <laughs> so why don't we give a big hand? And a big applause.